Hello, and today we are going to talk about direct variation. Let's start with this warm up and see what you got. Pause the video now and try these problems out. Okay, so for a problem like this, we're really down to two lines. We're either at N or M. Line L automatically looks like it's gonna not be quite as steep. Um, if we're looking at N and M, we first thing we wanna do is find our slope. So we're gonna realize that we can go uh, down, let's see, three, what's that, six, down six, to the right three. So the slope of N is gonna be negative two. Nope, slope of n is negative two. And then if we look at m, our slope is gonna be going up, uh, let's see, two, four, six, right two. So m has a slope of six over two, which will be three. So which line has the steepest slope? m. If we look at l, l is actually gonna have a slope of one half, and that's definitely not the steepest. Uh, we want to write the equation for each line. So let's start with n. Uh, let's use a different color. So n has a slope of negative 2. So y equals negative 2x. And then if I look at its y-intercept, it's 1, 2, 3. So plus 3. For m, m had that slope of 3. So y equals 3x plus, well, what's its y-intercept? 1, 2, 3, 4. That's a negative four. So I'm actually gonna change this to a subtraction of four. And then lastly, we have L. Line L has that slope of one half. And then we're going to say that its y-intercept is right here. So that's plus one. Okay, so direct variation. Direct variation is a relationship between two variables in which one is a constant multiple of the other. In particular, when one variable changes, the other changes in proportion. The best way to think about this, guys, is that a direct variation problem is just like a linear function. They're both linear, right? Uh, y equals mx plus b, mx plus b, and y equals kx are both lines. The only difference is this always has a y-intercept of zero. This one can have a y-intercept of anything because of that plus b. We can have a y-intercept of any number we want. So here's an example of a direct variation equation. The amount of money raised to the charity is directly proportional. So we see that word directly proportional. This tells us that we're gonna have a direct variation. So it's directly proportional to the number of attendees. We want to think about a direct variation as if there's no type of initial cost. Everything essentially happens like, uh, for example, if you went to the movies, it would cost uh, X amount of dollars per person going, right? If you were to order food at a restaurant, say you're ordering burritos, then how much it would cost in total is however many burritos there is. That's different than, say, if you go to a doctor. If you're going to go to a doctor, you have this initial copay which means that no matter what, if you are going to the doctors, it's gonna cost X amount of dollars, even if nothing's wrong with you, right? Now, it may cost more uh, if you have, like for medicine and everything like that, but that you have that initial fee of that initial copay. So we're told that the amount of money raised for five attendants was $100. So what we're gonna do here is if we know Y equals KX, then we know that this constant of proportionality is y over x equals k. So what that tells us is that we can say that attendees will be our x, so x will be attendees, and then, if I can spell attendees right, and then dollars will be our y. So this is a point, five attendees is $100, is five comma 100. So we know that 100 over 5 equals k, or essentially k is 20, meaning that each person, each attendee, will cost $20. So how much money will be raised if there is 600 attendees? Well, if I know y equals 20x, and I know that x is now 60, we can do 20 times 60, which will get us $1,200. So the final answer here is 
dollars. That's supposed to be a zero. So we did 20 times 60 and got 1200. So I want you to pause the video here. And again, remember we're looking at y equals kx. I want you to pause the video and try these two problems out. Okay, so if you uh, got that done, right, you were good with it, then let me reveal the answers for you. So for the first one, it should be 10.4 pounds. The next one is 640 feet. If you got those right, move on. If not, watch for the explanation. So the weight of an object, so weight varies directly. So when we see this varies directly, this is where it's telling us to put our equal sign and then equals K times the weight of the object on the moon. Oh no, so we have weight essentially for both of these things. Let's change our variables up. Let's use a capital E for our earth weight and let's use an M for our moon weight. So a 300 pound object on earth would equal 480 pounds on the moon. So we're gonna do 300 over 480 and we're gonna use that to solve for K. So K ends up being, K ends up being 6.25. So now we have an equation that we can work with. Essentially we know that Y equal, or E equals 6.25 M. And so now it says, how much would a 65 pound object weigh on the moon? So 65 is the E. To solve for M, we're gonna divide by 6.25. And we end up getting uh, 10.5. Sorry, I mean 10.4. Next problem. The distance required to stop a car, so distance, varies directly, this tells us where we're gonna put our equals, k times the square of its speed. Oh ho ho, getting a little trickier. So if 250 is the distance, and it says the car stopped travel at 60 miles per hour. So 60 squared. So now what we're gonna have to do is the first thing we wanna do is square 60. So get 250, equals K times 3,600. So to isolate K, we're gonna divide by 3,600 because division is the inverse operation of multiplication. And now we get K is roughly equal to uh, 0.0694 repeating. So now it wants me to know how many feet would it be required or how many feet would be required uh, to stop a car traveling 96 miles per hour. So let's change this. And now we're talking that it's 96 miles per hour. So we're going to multiply that by 96 squared. So I take my answer times 96 squared and I get the distance is 640 feet. Okay, next problems. So now we're gonna determine if the linear relationship is a direct variation, meaning that we already know it's linear. So if we know it's linear, we know that it should have a constant slope no matter what. We were already told that y equals kx. So that means that y over x has to equal k. So what I'm gonna do is to figure out the constant of proportionality if it happens is I need to divide every y by x. So 12 over one is equal to 12. 24 over two equal to 12. 36 over three is equal to 12. And 48 over four is equal to 12. So every single one of these is equal to 12, which means that my constant of proportionality, which is my k value, k equals 12. So notice if we wanted to write this, it'd look like y equals 12x plus zero, right? This would be our equation, where y is wages and x is time. But because it's asking for the constant proportionality, it just wants this. It just wants k equals 12. 
Okay, so again, all four of these are linear. I just want you to check if they're a direct va variation. And if they are a direct variation, state what the constant of proportionality is. So go for it. Pause the video now and try these problems out. For the fourth and sixth one, we get that they are direct variations with a constant of proportionality of 8 and 2.5, respectively. However, on 5 and 7, we get that they are not direct variations. So I think the yes is, is fine. We can look and divide and get you know all of them the same. But in uh, 5 and 7, I want to look at the no's. So if we look at 60 over 185, we realize that that is not the same as 115 over 235. Those numbers, one's like, you know, roughly a little less than a third, and the other one's almost a half. So we realize that those two aren't the same. In fact, number five is not even linear. If we do the same for uh, number seven, we realize that four over two is definitely not the same as five over three. And I think a lot of us are pretty okay with that. We also know it's not the same as 11 over five. And in fact, once you see one pair not being the same, then you instantly can stop and say, oh, this is not a direct variation. Okay, so let's look at uh, some more EOG review questions. This is one coming from, I believe, the seventh grade EOG. If it's not the, actually, it might be the eighth grade EOG. So what we're doing here is we're looking at two different types of cherries. Now, we know this is a direct variation problem because this number, we're only given one unit for pounds of cherries here, right? We're given pounds and dollars, that's it. If we were given two points, we might think it's just a linear function, but because we're only given one set value, we know this is gonna be a direct variation. We also look at our graph here. Oops, sorry about that. We look at our graph here and realize that this graph goes through the y-intercept. And so this is another way that we know we're gonna get a direct variation. So the first thing we wanna do is figure out our constant and proportionality. So we're going to take 13.3 and divide it by 3.5, and we get uh, 3.8. So this tells us that essentially the cost will be equal to 3.8 times the pounds for our uh, problem. So store P is selling roughly $3.80 per pound. So now let's figure out what's going on with store Q. So this is P. Now store Q is a little bit more difficult because I don't know exactly like where say this value is. I, I would be estimating on one, two, three, all, all of these values here, I'm not quite sure. But I do see a value that's really nice right here, right? That value is 1.25 comma four. So we know that if I were to buy 1.25 pounds, it would cost me $4. So we're going to do 4 divided by 1.25, and that will get us uh, 3. All right, so 4 divided by 1.25. Oh, sorry, 3.2. This gives us 3.2. So we know that for store Q, store Q, it's going to be the cost is 3.2 times the number of pounds, or $3.20 per pound. So now it says, Philip needs to purchase 10 pounds of cherries. So let's calculate how much each one of those would be in our respective store. So for store Q, cost would be 3.2 times 10. So it would cost $32. In store P, it would be uh, 3.8 times 10 which gives us $38. So I know P is gonna be more expensive. So this first one says uh, we'll spend $32 less at store P, that's not true. We'll store $6 less, that's not true. So now we have to look at B or D. So what we find is that it would cost him exactly $6 more at store P. So Cherries cost $38 at store P, $32 at store Q. So our answer is D. The next problem. Again, here we're not quite sure if it's gonna be a direct variation, 
But then we look at this graph, and this graph is a huge indicator that we're going to be dealing with the direct variation because of the fact that it goes through the y-intercept. So let's look at Alyssa. Alyssa, we realize that we can take 30 over 1 is equal to 60 over 2. And in fact, just to be sure that this is direct variation, we probably want to do it for each one. But we're going to kind of shortcut here and say that essentially she can do 30 jumping jacks per minute. So this is 13 or 30 jumping jacks per minute. For Melissa, uh, we have to find one of those nice points again. So here's a nice one right here. This tells us 100 jumping jacks in four minutes or 25 jumping jacks per minute. So which best describes the difference in rates? Well, I would say that Alyssa can do five more than Melissa. So that would be answer D again. Alyssa is doing five more jumping jacks than Melissa. Okay, so rain is flowing into two volumes of containers. Uh, let's see what we got. Again, this looks like a direct variation to me. If I wanted to, I could really make sure, but I can do a quick sketch and see, ah, uh, yeah, that's going to be direct variation. So let's find our two rates. For container one, it would be two over 10, which simplifies down to one fifth gallon per minute. And then for container two, we would realize that we could do four over 10 or 10 over 25 or six over 15. All of these will end up giving us two fifths. So what is the difference in rates of the two containers? Well, two fifth minus one fifth is one fifth. And so that would be our answer. We don't actually have to even look at D, but we know D is not right in this case. Okay, so that's a quick view of what direct variation is. Again, the big difference between direct variation and slope intercept form is that uh, we do not have uh, a, well, our y-intercept is zero on a direct variation. And in slope intercept form, our y-intercept is usually not gonna be zero. It's gonna be something else. In a, when we're finding slope in general, we're still going to do the difference of the y's over the x's. We're in direct variation. We know we can just take a y and divide it by that x of its same point, either one. All right. Well, hey, guys, do the practice on the wiki. And again, email, comment if you have any questions. Hope you guys are having, um, uh, being safe out there and having a good time doing some math. Uh, I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.